And then I thought, you know what? Are you actually thinking about quitting? You know, are you taking yourself down quit street? What is wrong with you? And I immediately, because I had never quit anything, ever. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 46 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Chris Sutton. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but here on the show, I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you didn't know, makes the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories, all of it for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we offer, like the Whistlekick Original Sparring Boots. We make these with a softer but more durable foam, which means they're more comfortable to wear and much longer lasting. And you know that annoying toe strap under your boots? We got rid of it completely. You can learn more about our sparring boots and all of our other gear and apparel at whistlekick.com. All of our past show episodes, all the show notes, and a whole bunch more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Now, let's move on to the episode. On episode 46, we're joined by Mr. Chris Sutton. With a broad and varied resume, Mr. Sutton is not the typical guest to martial arts radio. But before you doubt his martial arts credibility, he holds a number of accolades, including being the last person to receive a black belt from Joe Lewis. Mr. Sutton has, like some of our other guests, extracted the self-defense aspects of his martial arts training and not only refined it, but developed it into a system all its own. He tells some powerful stories and really opens up. You're going to like this one. Mr. Sutton, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. And of course, you were suggested to us by a recent podcast guest, Mr. John Graydon. And I guess you know him pretty well. And I think we're going to hear a bit about that today. Absolutely. That, okay, awesome. Well, before we get there, let's let's go way back. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, uh, I would like to... Uh, there's, there's a story I always tell, um, and it was one decision. Uh, I was about six years old, five, six years old, uh, mid-80s, and uh, I had a friend. His name was Anthony. And, my, you know, to preface this, my mom my mom was young. You know, she was 14 when she had me. So if that tells you anything, I, I, I grew up quick. Uh, so I'm about five, six years old, and Anthony, he comes over. You know, we're living in this apartment complex, and he says, hey, uh, I'm going to – I'm signing up for a – for little league baseball, uh, all you need is twenty five dollars for the registration fee, and uh, my mom will take you up there and we'll take you to practices. And I, so I ran inside and and I asked my mom for twenty five dollars on the spot. And um, she, I mean, single mom uh, broke. Uh, I heard the uh, the the words that started it all. Uh, Baby, I don't have twenty five dollars. <laughs> so I watched Anthony drive off with his mom, and. Uh, uh, from that point on, um, I realized, well, I'm not going to be playing baseball. So I was at the rec, uh, the rec center uh, and the local rec center in Largo, and I saw a sign that said uh, martial art lessons, $11 a week. So I I did everything I could to earn $11, everything I could. Uh, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I mow the lawn? Can I whatever, whatever it was so a six and seven year old can do. And I got $11 a week to pay for um, uh, my first martial art lessons in Largo, Florida, in a rec center. And my mom would move a lot, and we uh, so I would move schools. I would find a school to go to, and she kind of used it as a, uh, a babysitting service that would be dropped off hours before class started, picked up hours after class ended. You know, you're sitting there on the curb waiting for your, your mom to drive up. And I did every class I could while I was there. I mean, if I was allowed to do the adult class in the back off to the side, I would. I would do the kids class. And I, I you know, Jeremy, I must have done every single art there was. I mean, <laughs> if there was a school close enough to walk to or to get us there, I did it. I didn't look at the title. I didn't care what it was. Uh, we were in karate uniforms or martial, you know, whatever it was, I was there. Uh, you know, and then uh, I even, I even, uh, one of my first uh, experiences with a a dominant instructor, you know, main, the mainstream instructor was uh, a little show. You know, even when I couldn't go to a school, there was a show on in, in Largo, Florida called USA Karate. And the host was John Graydon. And I was taking lessons 
with John Graydon, uh, you know, on his show, USA Karate. I was doing it in the, you know, doing it in the living room and whatever he was showing. And so that was my first introduction to, uh, to John. And he's actually one of my first instructors. He didn't know it, of course, at the time, because he's hosting a show and I'm, I'm some poor kid in Largo, Florida, scrapping for any book, any school, any show just to be involved in this thing I love called the martial arts. Wow. And that's great. And I can totally see, you know, six-year-old you back there off in the side of the class, you know, mimicking what the adults are doing. But the thing that's really coming out for me is that's a level of dedication. You know, at, at that age, having the, the drive to earn money to pay for your own lessons. I mean, that's something that very, very few kids are going to be able to do. And you said you grew up fast, but even that seems really fast. So what was it about martial arts that you got so hooked on so young? Well, you know, uh, competitive personality, the fact that there's no seasons, it's not a sport. You never sit the bench. Uh, it never it never goes away. And it's all about you. I mean, if it, if your best kick is two foot off the ground, that's your absolute best. And you're always working on that. Someone might kick, oh, you know, over their head and can hold it there for an hour, you know, like Jean-Claude Van Damme, but that's his best. And it was, it was just that, uh, ever, you know, refining of you as an individual. And it matched my, uh, propensity as an athlete. I, I was, uh, you know, I found out that I had, um, uh, I was, I was blessed as an athlete. Uh, and I, you know, I, I excelled in, you know, high school and college and I, as a professional in the police department, I ran professionally on a, uh, international and national level. And those two, to me, were just perfect. You know, martial arts, <laughs> you're gaining your flexibility, you're building discipline, which you need as a as an athlete to go through these camps, to lose and get back up, to win and and not lead with your ego. It, it, so it all, it, it just the perfect marriage. That sounds great. And really seems like you had quite the vision and, and the ability to to look forward at a young age. And I'm sure that that's contributed a lot to your success both in and out of martial arts. And I'm sure we'll get into quite a bit of that as we go on. But now it's time for a story. I'd like you to tell us your best martial arts story. Well, uh, I have I have two of them. Two, two notable memories stick out. And they're more recent. I mean, I... I I did martial arts to a point where I thought that that's, I mean, that's, I knew it just inside, like, 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 you know, your own thoughts. So, and out of all that, growing up as a professional, uh, becoming a law enforcement officer, and then becoming an adult, and, and you have all this training, you have decades, but you're, you know, you're like, you're like everyone else, you know, you've been training since you could walk. What really stuck out to me? Two of them. Uh, one is being at AT&T Stadium. Uh, home of the Dallas Cowboys, not because I was in an NFL stadium, I've been there before, but I was on the field in the end zone speaking to other martial artists. Uh, John Graydon was there, the guy I started learning, you know, martial arts with decades ago. Uh, and the most important aspect of that was I was in a demonstration with my son. And my son, you know, there's there's a, a one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. I'm doing an anti-adduction technique in the end zone with all these martial art instructors and all you know all the public around I'm, I'm the representative for national martial arts day and the only thing i really cared about was that my wife was there my kids were there and i'm i'm working in what i love you know all these years later in a huge forum and you know on a huge platform and we're working together my son was doing a, what we call a low anchor where he grabs my leg so he can't be abducted and he does some role playing with his backpack and we do some bully prevention stuff and the look in his eyes in these in these pictures, when I look back, I'm like, well, this was the biggest thing in the world to him. And so it was the biggest thing in the world to me at the time. And it still is. It really, really sticks out. It's the first real time that I worked with my son because uh, I could see me in him. Wow. You know, I love the martial arts and and I could see that in him. And I, I just remember it. And number two, uh, you know. I, I've been through a lot uh, as far as my training. You know, I, I met Jim Graydon in the late 90s, uh, you know, became a black belt under him. Uh, and then I started training with a guy named Joe Lewis. You know, anyone in the martial arts knows that legend. And Joe took me under his wing almost like a father. And he's just a, a great human being. And 
uh, I wasn't in any, I would train with Joe, we would come to the school, he'd, he'd give seminars, I'd see him all the time, because uh, that was that family, you know, the John and the Jim and the Joe Lewis and all those guys. And I wasn't in a big hurry to get, an, you know, get another black belt. I, you know, I just, that hunger went away. And, I, and a lot of guys can relate. You get a black belt, you get another one, you know, that hunger goes away and then you're a businessman and you're just kind of on autopilot. Well, something just snapped in me where I wanted to get my Joe Lewis Fighting Systems black belt. Um, you know, Joe was diagnosed uh, with cancer. And, and so to me, it was it was it was now or never. And I, we had scheduled it numerous times. Uh, but one time I had knee surgery and then there was always something. So uh, the, the test date was scheduled. Uh, it was in Philadelphia. I went to Philadelphia. Uh, I did the Rocky Steps. I mean, the whole montage, I was running the steps for warming up and all that good stuff. I, you know, went down to the statue, took some pictures and, you know, the next day was test day. And uh, and so I took my Joe Lewis uh, black belt exam, uh, got my black belt. And um, it was later brought to my attention how significant that was. I was the last person to ever test for a black belt, throw a punch, throw a kick, um, receive rank while Joe Lewis was still alive. He showed up to the test. Uh, you know, we, you know, he came out of the hospital after, you know, 30 or 40 days and just to come to that test. I was the last round uh, and I wasn't up against another person testing for rank. I was up against uh, another Joe Lewis black belt that was just my opponent. So I would literally, it was brought to my attention that that was it. I was the last black belt while he was alive. And, um, you know, it's kind of an unfortunate honor. You know, you didn't want to lose him because he, he had passed away a couple months later. But uh, that will always stick out to me. I took all the uh, equipment that I used on my gloves in that in that fight and I, I retired him for my son. I want him to have him uh, have that stuff when he gets older. So I found it significant and uh, kind of an honor to be the last guy to ever test while that legend was alive. Wow. And that's such a huge honor. Yeah. And and. You know, listening, it sounds like there's a little bit of emotion coming into your voice. And, of course, we've had a number of people on the show that knew Joe Lewis well. Of course, the first one was Bill Wallace, who, you know, absolute best friends yeah. with Joe Lewis. And, and I've heard him speak of him several times and just loves him dearly. And, of course, recently we've had Rob Buckland on, who just the same way I have listened to Sensei Buckland talk about Joe Lewis with others and, and watch a, a very large, very intimidating, experienced martial artist get teared up. I mean, Joe Lewis was certainly a man that meant a lot to a lot of people, and you're no exception to that. Yeah, he, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, oh, please continue. He just, you know, he had such a presence, and he didn't, he didn't act like it. And th that combination was amazing. He could... You know, there's the one guy that could teach you a jab for a week straight and you're on the edge of your seat when, you know, some other instructors, you know, they, they want to teach you a sp jump spinning back kick and you, you want to fall asleep. He was just so dynamic in his background. And you talk, you're working with an, a living legend who was instructed by a guy named Bruce Lee, you know, among other people. Uh, and he just, he, his presence was so intense but he was just so down to earth. I mean, he just treated you like, you know, <laughs> you're, you, he's known you forever and you just, you'll never forget that guy. Wow. Did he ever offer you any, any advice, any it, it, you know, words of wisdom that you oh, pass on to us? Yeah. <laughs> if you can't jab, you can't fight. Um, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's, there's something that I hold uh, dear to myself that I, I don't tell too many people. I think I've told, uh, you know, one or two people. Uh, I know I told John, but, um, Leading up to the year that he was diagnosed, uh, Joe would call me out of the blue. I mean, you know, we had each other's cell phone, and he would just talk. He would just talk about. He would talk about weather. He would talk about these these schools that you know local to him because I believe he was um, living in uh, North Carolina at the time. I'm not quite sure exactly where he was, but we. He, and, and I'm thinking, why is Joe calling me and talking to me about just random stuff? And and so I <laughs> just those are stories, you know, where. You know, it's that's I will always have that. And it's just he would call and we would just talk. And uh, but as far as advice, you know, everything he ever said, in my opinion, was advice. The way he walked, the way he carried himself, the way he stood, uh, you know, the way he trained. 
I, you know, I, I remember I remember when he was going uh, through a separation, I believe, and, you know, he was down in Jim Graydon's school, and, and the man trained himself in, you know, he's 50-something years old at the time, almost 60, and he looks better than most guys in their 30, and 30s. And he, if you just, could just watch him train when he doesn't, you know, he – it wasn't a crowd of people. He just would be in the corner, just destroying a bag and moving. He never stopped moving. And, and he wasn't training for a fight. He was training for him. And it was just, you know, he's just an amazing guy to be around. And, and when, when he speaks, you listen. Um, and you, I guess you take it for granted that you get to be around him for so long and, and, and hear everything that comes out of his mouth. And you don't, you don't lack, you know, lock onto one specific thing, but everything he said, you just were like, he's, you know, He's, that's amazing, you know. So from his teaching to his to his ethics to just, you know, being in a room with him, everything was good advice from Joe. Listening to you talk about Joe Lewis, I'm finding myself a little jealous. You know, I've gotten to talk to a lot of great people and, and you know, there are a lot of a lot more great people that we'll get to talk to. And because of the opportunities with Whistlekick, I'm getting to train with some of these great people, but I'll never get to train with him. And, you know, Jeremy, there's one there's one defining moment about his black belts and the guys that he led when we went to his funeral. Uh, you know, it's there's pictures. There's this. I mean, this common knowledge amongst the guys that were there. Uh, they were about to, um, you know, back a truck up and just dump dirt on his uh, his his grave. And we actually I remember Brian Gates, a couple of, you know, Phil Maldon, and all, all these guys. We actually told the guy to stop and imagine 40 guys in suits, you know, Jim Great, all these guys. Uh, and we were passing everyone uh, did three or four um, shovels and then uh, passed it to the next guy. So we literally uh, buried him. Uh, we, 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 there's a line of guys and we took the shovels. We buried Joe because um, we didn't want that truck to do it. That was just that's he's a legend. He, did, he deserved more than that. His, his guys did it for him. Uh, so that that's an you know from start to finish that's that's a very defining moment in my martial arts career. Wow, that's that's beautiful, and certainly um, the best way I could imagine for all of you to send him off. So that's great, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, those are pretty pretty deep personal memories. Yeah, and I, and, but, I, and I hope they're okay for the podcast. I mean, they are pretty. Oh, pretty of course. Personal. No, they are, and and the best stories we have on here are the personal ones because we're, as an audience, trying to connect with you as a martial artist. So this great, deep stuff that you're sharing, absolutely wonderful. So let's switch around a little bit now, and I'd like you to imagine what your life might have been like without the martial arts. That's, uh, Tell us. that's very interesting. Um <laughs> well, you know, I believe I would have pursued my athletic career a lot longer because just like every other guy that's in the martial arts long enough, you decide you're going to go into business. And you and then you realize, well, anyone can open a business. It's all about staying in business. So, if I was never in the martial arts, I believe that I would have still developed a a self-defense company, uh, which I have, uh, the Cobra Defense Program. Uh, I was, I've, I've written numerous books. I've probably, you know, very. I have a creative knack. Uh, I like to create and develop and, and teach. Uh, I might have stayed in law enforcement longer. Uh, I believe, you know, or or um, uh, been sent away in the military. Uh, what really grounded me so I could not, uh, you know, go in the military because that's where I was headed was all the offers I had for playing sports and that kept me local. And then staying local, I, I joined law enforcement because it was the next best thing to being in the military. And, you know, I, I had that propensity to serve. I wanted to serve. I wanted to be in the, the quasi military organization. And Oh, <laughs> did I ever get a chance to do that? And that experience <laughs> was, was second to none. And uh, some of the, the best and some of the hardest times um, was when I was a deputy. So, you know, to answer your question completely, I just think I'd be serving in a military organization or still in law enforcement, um, writing books. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately, I don't know if I could have created Cobra without my martial art background. Uh, martial arts alone could not have created this program because 
I always tell guys, you know, self-defense is not martial arts. Uh, and, and I explain it like this, you know, do you like spaghetti and Italian food? Yes. Um, do you like pancakes? Yes. They don't go on the table at the same time. But they, <laughs> they are all, they are under the classification of food. Okay. So they are a food, but they are served at a different time for a reason. It confuses the senses. So I've been on a mission to separate those uh, for clarity in the industry because clarity breeds uh, good business. So, but having that martial art background, fusing it with my law enforcement training and field experience is the only way I think I could have created that program because you just can't think it up. So, um, I'm, you know, I don't think Cobra would have ever been developed, uh, you know, and we're 22 countries worldwide and we, we reach a lot of people. We, we make it a safer world. Um, you know, but I, I think I needed the martial art background too. You just, you just, cause there's a lot of police officers out there and they, they would need that tactical background that you get in the arts as well. So it's a great question. That one threw me for a loop. I can't think, I could not envision doing much else except for <laughs> raising my kids, writing books. Um, you know, being an athlete and, and going to work and outside of the martial arts, I loved uh, being in law enforcement. Well, normally I ask that question a little bit differently. And the question is, how did the martial arts change you? But of course, you got into the arts at such a young age. And actually, most of our guests have that this is kind of the fallback question. Where would you be without it? And I'm curious, you've mentioned your, your athletics through high school and college a few times, just out of curiosity. What sports did you play? Well, I, I, ran, I ran track. Uh, I played football. Uh, I, I, I wrestled a couple of seasons. I played basketball. Never, and this is the ironic thing if you go back to the, uh, the initial story, I never have ever played baseball. I have never swung at a baseball. I don't care for the game. And I think it was, I think it was that initial, hey uh, – you don't have $25 to pay the registration and seeing that kid drive off waving uh, and then you just, you know, you turn to the martial arts. So I, I ended up, uh, you know, going until I was about 29 years old. Uh, I, I was a collegiate, you know, I, I trained in track and field football. I, I always had a season. I was always playing sports. So when I got out of, college and I joined the police department, they had a law enforcement league for track and field. And, it, you know, for every gold medal you won, every silver medal you won, there was an incentive, you know, a certain amount of hours off or a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, personal time off or eight, eight hours of pay. But, uh, you know, you would train and you would compete nationally and internationally. You know, you're, you're racing against uh, Russians and, you know, the Chinese and they're all law enforcement and you had to qualify and all this good stuff. So I, I trained until I was about 29 years old. And then I was out jogging one day preparing for uh, an event and uh, my left knee, the spandex that were on it got really tight and I wasn't sure what was going on. I wasn't in pain, but uh, basically the cartilage in that knee uh, was depleted. Um, so I had to have surgery and then the right one I had to have surgery uh, a year later. And uh -huh. I can, and you know, all my years in the martial arts, I never suffered an injury, an acute injury from the martial arts. I, I, um, contribute most of my injuries that I've had to the long jump. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's, nothing, there's nothing healthy about sprinting 80, uh, 85 feet and jumping into a sand pit as, as, as far as you can over and over and then running the 100 and doing hurdles and running the 400. You know, your body takes a beating. And, you know, I started running track uh, at a very young age. Um, and I didn't even, you know, I always tell people it's the one sport I, I just hated running. No one likes to, you, you know, take their body and and use it, every muscle in their body for an extended amount of time. And it's not a team sport necessarily. And it's just, it's grueling. But I found out that that was something I was good at. And so I let it take me as far as I could. And uh, like I said, the martial arts helped me stay disciplined every season. You know, I playing football, I, I started out, I was a quarterback, um, started at running back, played quarterback. And I was kind of a, you know, put me anywhere type of guy. And uh, so, you know, the sports and the, the martial arts, perfect marriage and kept me going for as long as I could. But uh, once I hung up my cleats and could no longer play sports, the one thing I could keep doing is is uh, the martial arts and keep moving forward. 
Yeah, that's great. And, you know, going back a, a couple minutes. So the question maybe shouldn't have been, what would you have done without martial arts? It should have been, what would you have done if you had, if your mother had had $25 <laughs> for, the, for those baseball lessons? There's the pivotal moment yeah. <laughs> in your entire life right there. Yeah, that's a defining so, moment. You'll hit something I'll never forget. It's pretty incredible. So we've talked about some high points, some great stuff that's gone on through your life. I'd like us to go the other direction now. Think about a, something on the other end of the spectrum, something a little less than rosy, and how your time and your experience with martial arts helped you move through it. I got the perfect example. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I went into law enforcement and there was a, when I got out of the academy, there was a special division. You know, I, was a, I was assigned to maximum security and special operations in the Pinellas County Jail. And I was still in my brown uniform. I call them Dickies. You know, you're you're a rookie. Uh, and I was selected uh, to a unit. It was the Pinellas County Boot Camp. And what this was was the you you had criminals assigned to you, and your job was that of a drill instructor in a law enforcement capacity, which means. We're gonna we're gonna you know do drilling ceremony. We're gonna do all you know have intake day. These guys are assigned to us for a complete year, and the guys that were assigned to you were guys. They had to have five high pro, high priority felons. These juveniles are not juveniles. They're not little eight year olds. We're talking about six to three hundred pounds. Uh, they're seventeen years old. The court can't they can't assign them a, a sentence like an adult because they're not eighteen. So where do they send them? The boot camp. Uh, and their felons have to be vicious, violent crimes. I mean, robbery, uh, animal abuse, sexual battery, car theft. So these are these are what we got. These are the guys that we were in charge of on a day in and day out basis. So to create the instructor or the staff members to to deal with these guys, you had to become a drill instructor. And they, what they did in the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department is they took the Paris Island format, Paris Island, for, you know, that's where all the Marines, they go through their, their boot camp, and they adopted the format. They sent all the lieutenants and sergeants up there to get all the training and the format and how you teach. So going through this drill instructor academy was the, the hardest, uh, the single hardest thing I've ever accomplished. And I got I have black belts like every other guy. I've, I've, I'm, I've been through college. I've done all that. Um, uh, you know, my dad, you know, all that's difficult, but this was insane. Uh, it, you're talking learning to become a drill instructor, not getting yelled at to become a soldier. You had to be that guy. Uh, mm. And it, there was hazing. There was internal bullying. Uh, day one on the tarmac, we had 16 guys. By the end of the day, we had eight. They all quit. Um, wow. There were four slots available, and we were all fighting for it. The the uh, by the end of three days, there were five guys left. By the end of um, a week, there were uh, four guys left. The other three guys were former Marines. I was not. I was just in law enforcement. So these guys had been in the military. They, I mean, and so the drill, the you know, the drill instructors that were coming at us, I mean, they were in intense. You know, you had to learn the position of attention, uh, dress right, dress, stand at ease. It, you know, you had to learn it uh, verbatim. And, it, you know, in some of these positions were typed were, you know, two paragraphs long, you know, throwing chairs past you, all this stuff. And it was just intense. And you had to do it in a, in a period of three weeks. You had to, you know, pass the course. So they only had three slots. There's four of us. Those three were Marines. Uh and so I'm thinking, you know what, do I keep doing this? Do I, do I keep, you know, do I put myself through this um, uh, uh, you know, against these guys that were already Marines? It just doesn't look, doesn't look good. And then I thought, you know what, are you actually thinking about quitting? You know, are you taking yourself down quit street? What is wrong with you? And I immediately, because I had never quit anything ever. And so to me, it was a new feeling. Like I didn't know what that was. You know, and I went back to the, you know, there was no martial art test that I ever took, no black belt test, no punch that was ever landed on me that, that I felt, wow, you know, I want to quit. Um, so as a full grown adult, 
being assigned to this special division against guys that, you know, at the end of the day, when we got down to who was left out of the, the initial 16, I was going against experienced guys from the Marine Corps, and I was trying to be the Marine Corps drill instructor in a law enforcement capacity. Oh, that was daunting. And so it was kind of me, <laughs> me against them. And uh, what they, you know, I, what I did is after we were dismissed at every day at five o'clock, uh, I would stay out on the uh, the tarmac and learn my, my drill and ceremony. That was what I was having a hard time with, you know, left, right, all that good stuff. You know, how to, how to um, march a platoon and, and, you know, all my folds, you know, how to, how to properly, all my creases, everything. Um, and, you know, I stayed out there and, and my brother was in the military. He came out and he assisted me and I would stay out for two extra hours a day. And in the pictures um, on graduation, you can see my face is sunburnt. My, my lip is busted from the sun because I stayed out late. I showed up early. I never quit. Ne you know, and I, and I ran the, the obstacle course in record time. Uh, I contribute that to you know, my athletic background. That was something I could do well. And at the end of the day, when we got word of who made it, they literally opened up a new spot for me. So they created a slot um, you know, for the guy that didn't quit. And I tell that story because you can be as tough as you want to be. You, I mean, you can you can have all the trophies on your wall, all the belts, all the success and glory. You will be t tested one. There's you will be tested. I mean, you don't know when that time is, and it didn't happen when I was young. But that was it. I mean, I wanted to be in that division. I was assigned to it. They believed in me, and to see all these people quitting and to still keep going. Uh, almost blindly, <laughs> just, you know, I, I'm just not going to quit. You guys can say and do whatever you want, you know, and all the hazing and, you know, putting, uh, you know, pepper spray in your boots or on, you know, in your shirt, all that stuff. I just never, I never quit. And um, so they created a slot and uh, I worked for two and a half years as a boot camp drill instructor uh, until being reassigned to maximum security. And then uh, where you're in there with the, the adult inmates and then, uh, from there, I went to patrol operations as a, as a street cop. And I don't think that that's not, you know, that career isn't for everyone. You know, my, one of my first calls, Jeremy, was a, a shooting. It was, act, it was an active shooter situation where, you know, it just happened. I walked in, you know, the, the call went like this, 365 copy a call, 365 go, shots fired, and then they rattle off the address. When we show up, you know, I'm a rookie. This is like my third call. Um, you know, we kick the door open. There's still smoke in the air, dead body on the ground with blood running from her or something out of a movie, a girl crying and screaming in the corner. I see a weapon on the ground that broke when it hit the ground. And I have to go through the uh, the house and, and look for other suspects. And then your FTO, your field training officer, the guy that's assigned to you while you're still in observation is just he's sitting there chewing on his uh, his toothpick. And he looks at me, he goes, what do you got? Just calm. I mean, cool as ice. He's just standing there like, what do you got? You know, like, wh what happened, Chris? What, <laughs> you know, so they're looking at you saying, do you have a murder? Do you have a suicide? Uh, you know, is the killer still here? Or, you know, why? What do you got? And then you have to set up a crime scene, all this stuff. So to see that level of violence, to deal with the challenges in, um, on a daily basis as a cop and to try to stay healthy uh, mentally and physically was a challenge. And. If I wasn't, if I didn't have a foundation of, you know, almost daily training, never quitting, always, you know, always working hard and trying to achieve, I, I, you know, I would have been like a lot of guys and just washed out. You know, for every ten cops I hire, I think it's like only one makes it after his first year. They they wash out due to nerves. Um, they they do something wrong. You know, they they don't act fast enough or they just can't take it. You know, one of the classes they give you. Uh, in the academy, they sit you all in a room and they they show you about an hour's worth of uh, uh, police officers getting killed. The stuff you don't see on TV. Um, and then you're watching these videos and a guy's screaming for his life and this guy standing over him shooting him and they tell you the backstory. Yeah, this is Sergeant so-and-so. He's got five kids. He was on his last call of the night. You know, he's just like, oh, and you, you'll see guys get, you know, we had like four guys get up and leave that room never to be seen again. Uh, they were like, this isn't it. I'm not, I'm not going to get killed for $50,000 a year, um, from some crackhead. So you have to have mental toughness. The, the, why I'm saying this is 
it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a, a brain surgeon or a psychologist. There's things in your career. There's things in your life. There's things in your relationship that will test you uh, either all at once or a little bit at a time, you know, dying by a thousand cuts instead of one big one. And I, you know, I contribute a lot of the martial arts as kind of like a bulletproof vest. You know, a lot of stuff just bounces off or doesn't penetrate because you have that mental toughness. You you have that 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 ability to go out and train and release toxins and, and keep yourself in shape and not be that 300 pound officer with a heart problem who dies two years after uh, he, he uh, retires because he didn't take care of himself. So it's it's a huge foundation to have. It sets in uh, it sets in motion all these positive all these positive um, habits. Constantly training, working on your flexibility, being positive mentally, knowing that you can start as a white belt, which is kind of a nobody, and 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 go all the way up to owning a school, going all the way up to having a global company, whatever it is. Uh, so the foundation is is so important. That's great, and and thank you for taking us into what it was like with that training, with that law enforcement experience. I mean, I, I had to mute the microphone a couple times. Hopefully I got it before you heard it, you know, just from some of my reactions. I mean, you know, imagining you walking into that house, that third call, I mean, just heavy, heavy stuff. So again, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Well, you all, you also see, Jeremy, things, you know, you, you get dis, dis in, uh, it, it it led to my separation of what is real and what isn't. You know, I never once in my law enforcement career did a kata. I just, I never. I when I was working in in the jail, and you know, I'm like, I'm not. I can't throw a round kick to this guy's head. I mean, it, there's just so many principles that did not cross over, and that's one of the benefits because you can do it in a controlled environment. Um, and it's all theory based, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, it, but then you actually go out and apply it day in and day out and day in and day out, you know, use of force after use of force, aggressive situation after aggressive situation. And then your, your mind starts to, uh, differentiate what, what can I, all that training, I can only use this in this situation. Um, and 70% I, is irrelevant. Which really, really helped because you can't start a self-defense company that is uh, legitimate with tactics and business, but based off of nothing. Does that make sense? It does. So, so, and so if I hit a bag and uh, I've learned this and it's all, well, if I do this and then he does that, this should work. Um, you know, when you take someone that's done the martial arts for decades and then you put them in a career where they're, they're constantly having to use physical violence on someone, that's their job description. Whether I chased a guy for a half a mile, tackled him, and he, and he fought me and fought me and fought me, you realize that um, the tapping out doesn't come into play. Katas don't come, none of that. I was, you know, ask a million police officers or a million guys in the military that, that have seen action, ask any of them if they ever tried to tap someone out or got tapped out. That has nothing to do with Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That has everything to do with the separation of self-defense and every other do Quan itsu because the monster you're dealing with in reality is not a trained bjj guy or ufc guy they want to take your your friggin head off they want to they want to hurt you bad so when i when i cracked in you know to licensing cobra self-defense um you know i'm i'm in a room full of uh, professionals that have owned schools for 10 15 20 years done this like everyone else and when they hear that it, it rings true to them. Like, yeah, there isn't, there's no tapping out in real life, you know, and then we define what reality is. Um, and, and it helps them in business because they have clarity that, and I, and I tell one of the last articles I wrote, I, you know, I, you know, blatantly put in there, if you're teaching self-defense and uh, you know, let's say you've been in the martial arts 25 years, if you're teaching true self-defense and your student is at Walmart tonight and they're attacked, um, the, ironically, they're going to have more experience in real life in their first 10 seconds of that fight um, than you do. And I said, that's just that's not good. You know, so we tell guys that you have to plug into a resource or be the resource. So you either have to have that background or plug directly into that background in order to 
to teach it to, uh, you know, a public that doesn't know any difference. You know, the, the public doesn't know anything until you teach them in this industry. You know, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I'm standing right. in line at Starbucks and I'm wearing a Cobra self-defense shirt and, you know, someone might make Kung Fu hands at me and say, whoa, Taekwondo. I know someone that does Taekwondo. <laughs> they, they just don't know the difference, you know. So right. until we teach them. And I think what I'm trying to get at is I've taken great pride in in trying to bring clarity to an industry. You know, when you talk to a guy that can kick a grape off of your head without touching your head, then you ask him, you know, what is the secret formula that every criminal uh, owns, every criminal in the world? What is, what is a secret three-part formula that defines self-defense? And when that black belt that can kick that grape off your head cannot tell you that, you that's that division. You know, you're great at what you do, but self-defense is a different animal. And that three-part uh, formula is time, place, and method. They control that. Um, so being the authority on that, you, you try to empower the guys around the world to make this world a safer place by bringing clarity not only to the industry but to the public well absolutely great stuff and we've had this conversation on this show a number of times maybe not well certainly not with the depth that you've brought to it today but the difference between martial arts and your terming self-defense what i generally refer to as martial combat you know, that the combat and the art are two very distinct and different things. And it's great that your mission is to educate the public, to educate people, and to give them those real world skills that so many people need. Well, you know, Jeremy, one of the big things, you know, I tell guys, you can't get offended. Don't get your feelings hurt. I mean, there, there's, I'm not a point taekwondo guy. You know, if I get into the ring with someone that's a point sparring specialist, I'm probably going to last, you know, about 20 seconds or as long as, <laughs> as, long as I can run around the ring and, and lose this guy. I don't want right. to get on the floor with some BJJ guy and, and put him in a Kimura or some fancy arm bar and make it. That's not what we do. Um, you know, so in the industry is, is, is led with um, guys that are in competition with their almost religion like that's you know don't say anything bad about it well it's not saying anything bad there's just you got to know where to place it and you know when I, I i ask guys when i talk to them and we talk to guys all over the world and i ask them you know one defining question and then i make one statement and and that kind of wraps up our angle and i ask them when is the last time five adults called you up or came into your facility and i said be honest with I mean, when is the last time five adults came in within the last 30 days and asked specifically to train in your style, whatever it is? You know, hi, sir, I'm interested in um, learning Shotokan karate and I want to earn a black belt with you. And I and I asked him to be honest and I said, well, it doesn't happen. I said, I know because I, I opened a school and I'm a, you know, I'm a Joe Louis black belt. And I'm a this, but, you know, and, and I, I started realizing nobody cares, you know. The only ones that care are other martial art guys. Right. So that, you know, out of necessity, I developed a program that funnels adults into schools. Um, and when I and I let them know, hey, listen, you're opening a business that adults don't even walk into. It's all kids. And then adults kind of get in backwards. You know, my son was taking it. So I did. Or, you know, I, I want to lose some weight. And it's just so rare. And I let them know it's because you're trying to sell a VCR. Uh, or a beeper in the year 2015. <laughs> it doesn't. It you 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 know you're you you opened a VCR sales and repair shop in the year 2015, and you're disappointed that um, you're struggling as a business owner. And I and I tell them, okay, let's look at that. I'm not I'm not harping on what you do. What is a VCR for? And what's a beeper for? A VCR is for entertainment. A beeper is for communication. So in today's day and age, do people still want both of those? Yes. Change the vehicle, open a Netflix store, you know, sell flat screen TVs. Um, you know, uh, you're still providing entertainment with a different vehicle. Turn that beeper in and get a smartphone, you know. So, you know, you're still communicating via different means in a different vehicle. So, when I develop Cobra, we have divisions from active shooter to real estate to reality self defense, they're highly structured. Uh, like a, just a no ego approach, and it's and it's fortified with business. Uh, and it was built within a martial arts school, which is significant. There's a lot of add-on programs out there that uh, have genius marketing behind them, but have never been uh, market tested in a in a martial arts school. So 
to to re- to to go full circle with this as a professional. I opened my school in 2002, and you know I would field those calls. Hey, I you know I want to I want to learn how to defend myself. Well, I got this martial art over here called United Martial Arts, and I'm a Joe Lewis. And then I was like, you know what? Do you hear yourself? You you sound like every other black belt out there. You know, I've been doing this 20, 30 years, and I train with so and so. Nobody cares. All they care about is what's in it for them. You know how how do how do I how do I keep you safe? The thirty eight year old woman that was um, verbally assaulted at the local grocery store by some young kid. She doesn't run home and type Taekwondo into Google or anything like that. She wants self defense and personal safety. So you know, when when you know that dawned on me, I said, okay, well, let's recreate something that was very very effective at teaching anyone from uh, any walk of life, and that was my law enforcement. Uh, background. The the police academy, you know, you can have 30 guys all come in on day one and those lieutenants will look at you and say, nobody here is special. Everyone will start together, finish together. Uh, and so I recreated the complete police academy and now martial arts schools all over the world are using it because it is the single most effective way to teach uh, the same level from all walks of life. In any one academy, we'll have a police officer, stay-at-home mom, a 60-year-old, two teenagers, a bunch of girls, a bunch of guys, people in shape, people out of shape, people with disabilities. And that academy format um, funnels adults into schools. And then, you know, the question I was uh, given after one of our first academies was, well, what's next? Oh, wow. (laughs) So I realized that they didn't care about the martial arts. You know, we would we would sign droves of adults into our adult martial arts through our COBRA program. So at the, you know, what we finally realize is they don't care about the martial arts They They don't, it takes too long to explain where, you know, Okinawan karate came from and who trained with who people are emotional creatures and they like the experience they got that I recreated, you know, law enforcement academy. You always remember the guys you went to the academy with, all your instructors, it was, you know, just like boot camp. It's a defining moment in your life, just like college. If you graduated from, U, um, you know, uh, University of Florida, you're a Gators fan for life. It's that alumni. You create that experience, and that experience, um, they want to keep going. They want to keep going with that experience, and that experience was me and my facility. So we, we developed this system of keeping students in the martial arts via a different vehicle. And to me, that's one of the defining moments, you know, know, defining um, moves of of my career is if you like the martial arts, learn how to teach more adults and and more of what you love. And so we just packed out our adult martial art classes via our structured self-defense program. Interesting. That's really cool. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get towards the end of the episode. But that's all that's all good stuff and really i hope the listeners are are thinking i hope they're willing to open their minds and consider the stuff that you're sharing because it's it, it is true and it does make sense at least for me well it's, and i'm not going to call- say it does for everyone but there's certainly a lot of logic in there and i hope people are taking it to heart yeah we call i call it thinking outside the gi i mean i i i can teach you know, I can teach kickboxing in my gi and I take it off. I put on my self-defense instructor shirt and I, and I teach that class. And you, you don't have to compromise. We have traditional schools all over the world who their traditional programs are growing because they brought in a feeder program like Cobra. So if you think outside the gi, it's better for business. You didn't open your business to struggle. You didn't open your business to to have your wife look at you and go, hey, uh, you're bringing any money home? You know, right. it, it's. You want to be a business person and make money. You got to make the right moves. Absolutely. So, when we kicked off the episode, you told us about all the different people that you would train with, or, or that you had trained with a lot of different people, and you, you know, you offered us one, a couple names. But who would you say was the most influential on your martial arts career? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, very good question. Uh, being kind of a journeyman and just going uh, school to school to school. You, you know, um, Jim Graydon uh, and then John Graydon, and that, that, that circle, when I, when I met Jim, you know, I'd gone through a lot of Asian schools and a lot of you know, karate schools, uh, 
well, when I met Jim, Jim was one of the first guys I ever met that thought outside of his own uniform. You know, he created a fitness program. Most martial art guys can't, you know, they can't bring themselves to doing anything but their style of martial art. You, Jim was very diverse. I mean, he had a, a structured fitness program. Uh, no matter what happened to him, he, he kept going, he kept moving forward. Um, and, you know, he was my first introduction to full contact kickboxing. And he opened the door uh, to in, introduce me to Joe Lewis. So, you know, Jim, Jim still runs a successful school today. He's been around for ever and a day. And he was a, a great mentor. I learned a ton of business stuff, um, you know, and, you know, <laughs> you know, little advice is, you know, I, I remember Jim saying, you know, watch the young guys, you know, watch these, uh, the, the young guys in your, in your school, they'll, they'll hit on the women and break your equipment, uh, break your equipment and, you know, stink your gym up. Um, you know, the, who pays your bills are the, the mothers with the checkbooks they make all, you know, so all the, all this mentoring that my goodness, you, when you see guys get into business and, you know, just because your sidekick is phenomenal, you it doesn't mean anything. It's you got to be able to be a good businessman. You don't get paid to throw sidekicks. You can throw sidekicks in your living room until your leg falls off. You, no one's going to give you a check for it. They're going to give you money for giving them the experience of being in the martial arts, and that experience better be good. So, you know, Jim once told me if you can't if you can't close a sale at the front end, um, go clean up someone's puke on the the, the mat. Uh, and deal with a parent complaint all in the same 20 minutes, then you shouldn't be in business. And hope, lo and behold, you know, I've been in business 13, 14 years, and I, that couldn't ring more true. And, um, <laughs> and, and so he, he, was, he, was a, he was a great mentor later in my years because I, we stopped moving. I was an adult at that point, and I, you know, I could train with him as long as I want, and I did not have to, to break away. So he was, he was a great influence. Wonderful. How about competition? Uh, to go back, to, we haven't talked about that. Yeah, the, the the competition aspect. I never crossed that threshold. I never, a it really never appealed to me. Uh, I was more into the practicality of of what the martial arts can do for you. And also, I moved a lot when you know until I was eighteen, nineteen. I was, um, you know, I was in a new school every know, year and a half to three years. Sometimes, you know, just six months at a time. So it's incredibly difficult to get on that circuit and travel and train and, and get into competition. Okay. It's fair. Um, honestly, it's a little surprising. I wonder, you know, because you, you said before you were so competitive. I wonder, you know, and of course, one of your big mentors, Joe Lewis, you know, how, how did he rise to notoriety? It was was through competition. I wonder, again, had life taken a different track, I wonder how you would have done with that. I bet you would have been pretty good at it. Yeah, I think I think I was, you know, my athletics had a grip on me, and that was where my heart was as far as competing. And I and I know me, if I were to get into competitive martial arts, I would drop everything else, and because that's what it takes. You you have to live it, and uh, I wasn't. I wasn't willing to do that. I was too busy, you know, uh, being this track champion guy and playing football and doing all this other stuff. And um, so while earning accompl accomplishments and, and, and defining my, you know, psyche and my body through the martial arts, that was the vehicle I used. You know, stay strong, stay flexible, um, keep moving forward, uh, learn the discipline, you know, learn all the fighting aspects. That's what the martial arts supplied. My competitive desire was when I achieved a new belt in the martial arts. Yay, I did it. That's great. But I didn't need a trophy. I didn't need a belt. I didn't need any of that. I love the competition of sports, just flat out beating someone at their own game. And you could say that about the martial arts. You know, you're beating someone in, in at their own game. But I just that was that was where my heart was. Fair enough. So how about people that you haven't trained with? If you could add somebody to that great list that you've got. Well, who would it be? It, 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 it's going to be cliche, but it's a little closer to home to me. I mean, when you, when, when Joe sits down and he talks about, you know, <laughs> well, when Bruce was doing this and Bruce, I mean, I would love to train. I would love to be in the presence and train with the great Bruce Lee. Uh, clearly 
he was an innovator for the arts, uh, making it more mainstream. And uh, he taught Joe Lewis, who taught me. Um, and to me, that's, you know, that's kind of like your great grandfather. That's your lineage. That's that's where some of your influence came from. And, you know, anytime you're sitting there talking to a guy that's that's trained with uh, Bruce Lee and he's telling you about their his experiences and, and, you know, Bruce did this and he asked me that. It's just great. So I would love to train with that man. It's certainly the most given answer yes. to that question. And it's interesting that if we, we think back, this martial arts actor, because that's how he had such a strong influence on all of us. It was not because he had a chain of 500 martial arts schools. It was what he did in cinema and on, on television. If it, well, if I could have, if I could have one more, clearly I want to sure. be with Bruce Lee cause he was, he was my instructor's instructor, but um, it, you'd have to time travel. Uh, Musashi, he was, yeah. he was a defining character in the arts. Um, you know, it, 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 my favorite book, you know, book of five rings phenomenal. I mean, you can read that book and apply it to business. You can, you can apply it to your daily life. Uh, it's it's a, it's a great book. It stood the test of time, um, and to to be so good at what you do to the point where you have to use a wooden paddle to beat your opponent because you just want to make it fair or to challenge yourself in a different way. Um, that's greatness. And he did it in a time where you had to win. And that's what I I tell people all the time. You know, the martial arts have been standard from when you had to fight to win. That was that was the real martial arts. In my book, you know, there was there's no belts, no trophies, no no one cared about any of that. I don't care which color belt you have on. I'm going to attack you. Survive that situation. So to be such a, 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 a dominating presence in what he did, and to you know he opened a school and taught, um, you know, almost like a like a Luke Skywalker. You know, um, he got to that level, and then he's you know that greatness level. So he's just, he's so good at what he did. Um, and I really, I've researched everything about him. Um, and he's, that's, that's a guy I would like to train with. That's an answer we haven't had before and, and wonderful. And of course that gives us your favorite book question that I would have asked you shortly, but how about a uh, favorite martial arts movie? I have, I have two. Uh, okay. One is the cliche karate, you know, the karate kid. You know, you see that. How can you not get pumped up about the teacher student relationship, all the lessons learned there? You know, the original karate kid, of course. Right. Uh, you know, wax on, wax off, uh, you know, both sides. You know, I'm, all, I'm done, Mr. Miyagi, both sides. And he, you know, <laughs> then, then he starts to question his teacher. And then uh, clearly, uh, you know, Miyagi had um, his best interest in mind. So it, that's a great movie. But uh, more so, you know, I referenced uh, Luke Skywalker. I like the the Empire Strikes Back and the Return of the Jedi. And while you'll you'll say that those aren't martial art movies, they're clearly um, parallel to the martial arts. You know that the scene where uh, Luke goes to the Dagobah and he's training with this little green guy who doesn't look like he can do anything. Um, you know, he's he's using his mind to focus, to balance rocks, to do all this stuff. Uh, then he loses his cool. Same thing in the Karate Kid. Questions his yeah. questions his teacher, his master, uh, and you know he maybe thinks he's you know maybe thinks he 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 can't do it. He can whatever whatever the situation. His teacher says uh, you can do this or, or don't try. You know, do or do not. Uh, there is no try. That whole thing. Um, and so he lifts his ship up out of the water, and then he becomes a believer, you know. Uh, and he continues his training in Return of the Jedi, masters his weapon, masters his mind, uh, and then returns to see if he's fully vested as a Jedi. And he says, no, you have to go confront your father. And to me, that's confronting your fear. What's, what's your fear in life? Your fear to, you know, to start a business, to, to stop a business, to stop a relationship, whatever it is. It tells a, a great story, and it's very streamlined. It has all the principles of martial arts in there, and you know all the combative scenes and all the you know be focused and all that good stuff. So, I like those two movies in reference to what it brings uh, to the martial art table. Those are wonderful movies, of course, movies that I really enjoy. I don't know that I've ever drawn the parallel with martial arts in the way that you have, so I think that's fantastic. And of course. 
there's got to be something special to them. When we go back, we watch them now. No, they don't have the special effects. No, they didn't have amazing acting. But yet here they are close to 40 years later. We've got sequels coming out. And the world is pumped up about that yeah, because you can you can relate to it. I mean, it tells it tells right. a great story. I mean, and it is so closely knitted to the martial arts. You know, George Lucas will tell you that uh, Darth Vader's helmet was based off of the samurai helmet. And when you see that, you're like, well, yes, it is. That is it right there. Oh, oh wow. So, and, you know, and the black capes, the black belts, you know, the samurai sword, the lightsaber, all that stuff. It's it's very it's very parallel and you know, those two worlds. And I guess you have to look into it a little bit more. Um, and I, and I did. And to me, it's, I can sit down and watch those movies day in and day out. Wonderful, wonderful movies for sure. How about a favorite martial arts actor? Would that be Bruce Lee or somebody different? Uh, he, well, he was only, he, he only had a handful of movies. Um, uh, you know, that those were great. Um, but I, you know, I like, I like Jet Li, uh, because of his range of acting, he can go from a very traditional uh, back in time, uh, walking on the tree tops, you know, fantasy land type martial art movie down to playing a villain in Lethal Weapon. So to have that range and he's not he's not he's not stuck in a typecast. You know, he's not the guy that can do the splits. He's not the guy that, you know, you know, does the same thing in every movie. Jet Li has been in a, a ton of movies, and he's um, extremely popular and famous uh, in his homeland um, for what he can do. And he, he, you know, he came up through a very traditional upbringing uh, to to be able to do what he's doing. So, and to transition that into mainstream American TV, um, I, I love it. And I just just watching the guy move is is phenomenal. One of my favorites for sure, as well. So we've talked a lot about what you're working on now, but do you have any goals? What are you striving for as a martial artist right now? Well, you know, to to bring let's back up real quick. Sure. What am I what am I striving on for the future as a martial artist? When we developed the Cobra program, we we found that there was a there is a gap where these students that were in the self-defense program didn't necessarily want to go into a traditional martial art. They didn't want to get a, a white uniform and stand at the end of the line and, and wait three or four years to accomplish their main goal. So we developed the long-term uh, modern adult training program called the Cobra Fighting Systems. And it, that went, you know, that went international as well. And the reason it became uh, popular really quick is it's not traditional. It doesn't have the gatekeepers of tradition. It doesn't, you don't have to say, you know, there's, there's no masters, no senseis. You can wear, uh, you know, your, your shorts, your shirt. Um, we even got the, the ranking system down to wearing a colored wristband on your, on your, uh, on your wrist, because, you know, the inspiration for pulling a lot of the tradition out, but keeping it just a hint of it, um, was, you know, I was out at a grocery store one time and I, and I saw a family that just got out of a martial art class clearly. Um, but other people were staring at them like it was Halloween. You know, they, they were all in their white uniforms and their sandals and their shopping as a martial artist. I know what they, you know, I know what they just did and I'm, right. I'm not staring at them like they're in a circus, but everyone else was. And I, and I realized that my true passion is to get more people exposed to what I love to do. And it's all the martial arts, all the self-defense. So how do we keep adults longer than 10 weeks if they don't want to be in that uniform and, and have that stigma attached to them? You have to create something that makes sense to them. So we created the, the Cobra fighting systems. The word fighting came from uh, my homage to uh, Joe Lewis, the Joe Lewis fighting systems. I, I didn't want to create, co you know, Cobra MMA or Cobra martial arts. The word martial arts isn't even in it. And it's almost like a, a college-based training program. You get credits uh, for every class. You can wear normal clothes, um, shoes on or shoes off. They do their scenario training. They do you know, their kickboxing, all their self-defense. Um, it's a very unintimidating and modern way to train. So my goal is to push more of that, to push our Cobra fit, to push – the Cobra brand, because right now, 
I feel as though the industry is sprinting. You know, guys want to sprint and they want to do well and they're breathing through a straw. And of course, you're going to struggle. Of course, that's painful to be in business. Of course, you know, you, you, your phone's not ringing off the hook. Um, you have to have the courage to change. You have to have the courage to ask yourself, what does the public want and how can I give them more of it? And it has nothing to do with uh, how you were brought up. It has very, you know, you have to go, you, okay, I can get more adults or more kids or this market by doing this. It's proven, it works. And then you implement it, and now you're a more, you know, a more proficient uh, and effective instructor. Um, not because we taught you a kick that you didn't know. It's because we took that straw out of your mouth and allowed you to breathe. So the fighting systems is they they earn a black belt in it. They get out of their ten week program. We give them credit for the training they already did. They have that significance. They feel part of something. They get to stay with the same instructor in the same facility long term. It builds businesses and it gets more adults involved. And creating and re, you know refining these programs is my main goal. Uh, I have a couple books coming out. You know the uh, one's called "There's No Tapping Out in Real Life," um, and it's it's the the trials and tribulations of coming up in the industry. You know some war stories, all that good stuff, and um, just more of a motivational book. And uh, you know, and just developing a developing clarity if i could just wrap it up developing clarity in the industry because you got to remember i we talk to guys all over the world so we get a good feel for for what's out there in every market not just karate guys but guys that you know we have guys that teach out of churches we have guys that own multiple schools we have guys that haven't even opened schools but they're they go through our training system and they're, they're very motivated um and you start to get disappointed with a lot of guys who can't think outside the gi you know, they call, they're, they're frustrated. They call you and they tell you, I don't have a lot of business and I want, but they still want to, uh, you know, they, they, they think that the Cobra Defense program is, is offering a class and it's not, it's a business. Um, but then we, we have guys that are so successful. I mean, we have guys that um, they give you unsolicited uh, emails about tripling their business. And, you know, we have guys that take this to Cambodia and teach their law enforcement and, and, uh, help prevent sex trafficking and, and violence over there and corruption. So uh, my my mission for the future, my goals are to, to you know, we're at 22 countries. I would like to be at uh, 60 countries strong, you know, 400 locations. That means there's more people in the world training in what we all love. You know, at the end of the day, it's all martial arts. You know, um, I, I said before, there's a difference between self-defense and martial arts, but we want more people kicking and punching at the end of the day, you know, and that's, that's my goal. Fantastic goals. And through the discussion, you've talked a lot about Cobra and everything. And I think people have a pretty good idea of what it is that you're offering, but uh, just on the, I guess more on the business side, if somebody wanted to learn more, if they were interested in bringing this to their martial arts school, Oh, where would they go to get more information? Well, it's it's very simple, and, and, and Cobra is Cobra is a business system with law. It's a law enforcement based. So, if you are a school owner out there, you know you're if you want to be part of a global brand uh, that teaches legitimate tactics, you know you don't get more legitimate than law enforcement based. And when I say law enforcement based, we literally. We, we took everything from the tr law enforcement training division except for patrol operations and arrest techniques uh, because that's that's not conducive to, to training a civilian. Um, but we have uh, easy ways to get involved. You'll be able to offer the Cobra Self-Defense 10-week program, the five-week program, one-day camps for kids, adults, the anti-bullying program, active shooter. Uh, and we, we have guys all over the country teaching active shooter uh, for schools, churches, and businesses. I mean, they're saving lives and, and adding tremendous value. The Cobra Fit program is, is, is huge. It's the fitness division that we have. Um, it's, it's a fighter's workout. There's nothing, there's no better way to get in shape than a fighter's workout and routine. Uh, we have a lot of, on all those divisions make money on their own. So you can have access to all of those by going to self-defense certified dot com self defense certified you can try it for free uh, there's i mean w we've been told that we are uh, one of the you know one of the most organized and structured add-on companies out there and one of the most affordable our customer service is impeccable we you know we we answer the phone i mean 
all of our trainers and managers from me all the way down to our, our directors, they, they pick up the phone and they, they give solid advice. Is the news coming out? This is the demonstration you should do. Um, okay, you got a business that wants your services and they have 50 employees, how should you price it? So we're, you know, they have the complete business model. Uh, they get websites, they get everything. They get uh, all the marketing, all the support uh, and, you know, in a proven system. I mean, we've, We've been around since 2002. So selfdefensecertified.com, if you if you want um, social proof, if you want to see guys actually using it, go to selfdefenseprofessional, selfdefenseprofessional.com. That's our magazine. Uh, you can go on there and, and read. We have uh, owner testimonials with all their, you know, school pitchers, class pitchers, uh, unsolicited testimonials about how much money these guys are making. Um, and we have reference lists for you if you want to call them as well. So uh, you can also... Check out our uh, anti-bully program at uh, uh, bullyactionplan.com, bullyactionplan.com, selfdefenserealestate.com is our self, uh, real estate division. And we have guys that make $500 for a 90 minutes session in front of real estate agents, just teaching them the do's and don'ts of, of self-defense. So we have a lot of different ways that our school owners make money. Um, and we have guys that are extremely successful and they don't even own a brick and mortar school. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, going out there and getting it, uh, a three thousand or five thousand dollar a month lease, and all this, you know, all the signage. Um, if that's not something that you can afford or even want to do, we'll show you how to actually get your business started without a brick and mortar school. Go to satellite locations. We have guys that teach out of, uh, um, you know, Zumba facilities, dance halls, um, the you know the local community center. So it doesn't. You don't need that prerequisite, and you don't have to be a martial artist. Matter of fact, a lot of the martial art guys are the hardest ones to work with because you have to untrain them. You know, right. m one of my sergeants in the police department, you know, said to uh, the group, he said, you know, the best shot in this class will probably be a female. And so we we asked why, because they're a clean slate. We can teach them how to do it right the first time. A lot of guys come in with bad habits, you know, they're doing the cup and saucer um, technique with their gun and so there's a lot of bad habits that you have to break there. So, and he was right. You know, one of the top shots in the academy was a female. And, but uh, we like working with guys that are open-minded, that think outside the gi, um, and we have a lot to offer. I mean, every guy that uh, brings us on and follows the game plan is successful. Wonderful. And of course, we're going to have links to everything that you just mentioned, books, the the whole shebang, all the things that we've talked about today, over at the website whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Thank you so much for sharing all of this stuff with us, and I'm hoping you have some last words of wisdom. Yes, and thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it's I mean I I love doing interviews, and I I feel as though if I'm if I had one thing to say to every martial artist and self defense instructor out there, uh, reevaluate everything that you're doing to to add value to yourself, to your family, to your bottom line. If it's working, keep doing it. If it's not uh, adjust it. You're you're in this. If you're in the business of martial arts, um, that is your primary concern: to be in the business and to be making more money to you know support your family and have a uh, you know a healthy business career. And uh, also, anytime things get tough, I mean, you know, whether you just get out of surgery, you go through a divorce. Uh, I, I've always turned to the martial arts. I've always turned to training. I've always turned to setting goals. Go earn a, a, another black belt or another degree on that black belt. Uh, get involved in something new in the martial arts. Go hit a bag. Uh, work some focus mitts. J you clear your mind and reestablish who you are as a as a human being, uh, and that will lead you in the right direction. Everybody needs a system reset every once in a while. Everyone, and the martial arts is is perfect for that. It's total body cleansing. It's clarity. It's all about you. And that's that's why it's so powerful and so important. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you having on and, and being so open and honest with everything you shared. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to episode 46 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Sun. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about today, including links to Mr. Sutton's programs and how you can learn more about training or adding them to your school. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up with everything we do. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to leave us a kind review wherever you download podcasts, we'd appreciate it. 
Remember, if we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our great sparring boots, available at whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.